Saw Guy Podcast. Like scary movie. Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Here's Johnny. We'll tear your soul apart. The boogeyman is real. And you found him. Game over, man. Game over. What do you want? I want to hear you scream. Welcome to the Saw Guy Podcast, as always, I'm the Saw Guy, and I'm bringing you episode 25 on, dun 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 I had to talk to the microphone for the audio people, so, uh, <laughs> I tried to do it so it was more effectiveness, kind of like the theme, but obviously I fucked that up. This episode is, yes, on Jaws, the first Jaws, I might add, not too much, not a knock on the sequels, don't get me wrong, the sequels are all good in their own right, <laughs> I don't want to get into the whole aspect of them because um, the first one was creepy as hell and creepy and scary because it could actually still happen. You know, it's like true life horror. The other sequels were it's like the Jaws, like I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like the, the shark had relatives and it comes after him and it follows them all over like, really? <laughs> you know, it, it's just they, they kind of ran out of ideas towards the sequels. Yeah. But this whole episode's on the first one. And why did I choose to do the first one? Because it's fucking Shark Week! Come on, man. Are we all excited about this or what? Shark Week. Dun, 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 dun. And uh, <laughs> also, too, it's because during this time, Shark Week, they usually switch off between August, the end of July. Well, this year, it's, you know, July 22nd of 2018. And during Shark Week, it's not just, you know, the main, like, animal channels and stuff that does it on TV or whatever that hypes it up. Everybody gets involved. It's gotten bigger and bigger through the years. I'm pretty sure you're going to see a shitload of Jaws Marathon. So, and possibly more of the sequels, but I wanted to focus in on the first movie, right? And the first movie came out in actually 1975, a long time ago. Not too long ago if you're my age. You know, you probably remember it like yesterday, but... Anyways, this movie came out in 1975, and it was based off a book written by Peter Benchley. And Peter Benchley, he heard of this whole story of, you know, this shark coming, like a big shark, actually a great white, coming up real close on up shore. It ate a dog. It attacked a kid. Um, various different things, you know. And he wrote a story about it, and it became this number one bookseller, right? Well, I was as it was climbing up the charts and becoming this number one book, Steven Spielberg got a hold of the story, and he was like, oh, shit, I have to make a movie of this, you know? And Steven Spielberg, he wasn't well-known at this point yet, and a lot of people are going to argue, and they'll kick and throw fits and shit, and they'll tell you that this was his first film. It's not. <laughs> Steven Spielberg got his first start on a thrilling horror film called Duel, and that's a little bit later on. Maybe I might do an episode on that, because I love that fucking movie, but this is about Jaws, right? So anyways, he gets a hold of the whole story and gets a hold of the original author, Peter Benchley, and he says, okay, let's make a movie of this. So they get it funded and they start making a movie. And this whole movie follows the aspect similar to the story, but obviously when you go from a book to a movie, you know, things change. They take some stuff out because it's fluffed up or it might be too graphic, things like that. I mean, case in point with the whole recent remake of It, you know, yeah. <laughs> but anyways... Jaws starts off, the first five minutes, scary as shit, because it, it plays on that less is more approach, you know, what I've been talking about the last few episodes, but um, it starts off, you know, all these young kids are having a bonfire out on the beach, drinking, having a good time, right? Well, anyways, this dude and this chick, they're all like, okay, let's go and do skinny dipping in the ocean, <laughs> in the middle of the night, like probably two, three in the morning it'll look like, right? Well, anyways, she goes out there, whoosh, already naked, jumping and swimming in the pool the uh, towards the end of the booty. Her boyfriend, or her guy friend, I guess uh, they played off that he was so drunk that he couldn't get off his pants and he just, you know, passed out. <laughs> he passed out on the fucking beach. Uh, how funny is that? And so she's swimming there and then she actually notices like, hey, I'm already halfway in here. Where the fuck are you? You know? And then that's when all of a sudden, dun, 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 you hear the music. And, um, the music, I want to add a little note real quick, is John Williams did this. John Williams, he's best known for doing the Star Wars theme and a bunch of other major, uh, major, 
major motion picture films. But Jaws really kind of put his name out there a little bit more. He's been doing like a lot of 50s and 60s, like late 50s and 60s TV shows, TV movies. Um, but Jaws really got him in there because he made the he made the theme, and basically he was half of the success of how good the movie was. But anyways, back to the movie. The chick, she's over here, and you hear the music, and all of a sudden it shows her swimming from underneath, which is a creepy kind of, you know, photography way that, of how you would film something. But it worked. It, I mean, it really made it work. She's swimming, and then she gets tugged, and then she gets pulled and pulled. And then all of a sudden she starts screaming in pain, you know, but, and you don't know what it is because it's just basically moving all around. She goes on the booty and tries to hold for a dear life, and all of a sudden, it hurts! Oh! That's the end of it, right? <laughs> The next day, well, later on, because it's sun rising, as you see her passed out boyfriend on the beach, you know, you, we follow Sheriff Martin Brody, who is, well, I, I shouldn't say sheriff, he's, the, he's actually the, uh, what do you call it, the chief. He's the chief of police in this little island called Amity, this is where everything all takes place, and in the town of Amity, there's probably like maybe 100 people, <laughs> so it's a real small community. If you live in the Southern California kind of area, I guess you can kind of relate with like Catalina Island. It's kind of like that. That's basically how they played it off, right? And so, Fourth of July weekend's coming up. They're all getting prepared because they get a lot of tourists to come in. They hang out at the beach. Well, anyways, you know, the chief, he gets a call and he goes out there to the beach. And he's hearing about this guy where he's like, I don't know what happened to my, my friend. Uh, she went out there. Maybe she drowned. <laughs> And it was kind of cheesy because it's like 70s, like, she might have drowned, but you don't give a shit. It just kind of looks like that, right? And then you see the other police officer, well, I should say sheriff deputy. He's over there, you know, puking his brains out and says, hey, we got a body over here. Ends up being the girl that got attacked from the great white shark. You don't know if it's a great white shark, but you just know that it's a shark, right? And then throughout the whole movie, it follows that the chief, he's telling the mayor and everybody, hey, I'm going to shut down the beach. This looks like a shark attack. We never had a shark over here in these waters. You know, I want to play it safe. Obviously, <laughs> the mayor, the actor who played the mayor, I forgot his name. I think I wrote his name down here. Uh, Murray Hamilton. That's who it was. Sorry for that little blank space right there, but I had to look it up on my notes. I made sure I came prepared so I don't look like a rookie. <laughs> but anyways, he gets a hold of... Uh, the chief and tells him, hey, you can't shut this down. You need to get it passed and run through me, through the government, all this, da 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 And they kind of fucked with him a little bit because he's from New York. And they basically play off that Amity is this island uh, close to New York. Um, I would say more or less like, kind of like how Catalina is with Southern California. Um, but anyways, and... They follow this whole story of him, like, going to the corner and everything and doing all this. And then next day happens, they're at the beach, and nobody bats an eye. Everybody's just doing their normal thing. He's still tensed. His wife is kind of talking to him. And he's a normal family guy. He really is, the chief. Chief Brody, he has, uh, I think they implied that he had three boys. And he's married with his wife. And, you know, they're still kind of settling in, it seems like, because his wife is talking to the friends over there. Asking if they can be, if they're already like local, because I lived there for a while. And all of a sudden, uh, you hear the theme music. Dun, 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 right? All these kids are all playing. And uh, they show this scene where this kid, his name's Alex Kittner. He goes up to his mom and says, hey, you know, I'm going to go back in the pool. And she's like, no, let me check your hands. Oh, you're too pruny. No, go out. And he goes, oh, one more. Okay. Well, it ended up being his last ride. <laughs> Let's just say that, you know. Um, they show that all the kids are out there. And this is what was crazy for me as a kid, because it's like, you see horror films, especially new ones, they don't ever show that they go after, like, children, young people, unless they're, like, teeny boppers and shit like that, you know? But this is 1975, and this is a great white shark, and it shows very graphically that this kid's swimming, and then the shark just comes up, grabs him, and then the kid's, like, screaming, and then the kid kind of flips up in the water... And then it shows that he gets pulled down, and it shows all the blood, and everybody runs out. All Everybody, you know, all the kids, all the teenagers, all the old people, they all run out. And then the lady who, uh, the Kittner lady, she goes up, she goes, anybody see my boy? And then they show, like, the floaty kind of coming in. And, yeah, that was a fucked up scene, because it was just like, whoa, okay. 
And then later on, they figured out that uh, she gets pissed for obvious reasons and starts, you know, demanding questions, gets everybody involved. And then eventually they start to say that it's a shark problem, right? They have a town meeting. Everybody's asking, okay, well, what are we going to do? And then, you know, they kind of throw it out there that, hey, there's a $3,000 bounty reward for anybody that goes and catches it, any fisherman. Because it's a fisherman island, they, uh, they, put, they posted that out there. And then that's when you have the iconic scene of Quint. <laughs> He's the the one of the main fishermen over there. He scratches the key, the I was gonna say the keyboard. He scratches the uh, the chalkboard. Three thousand, I'll find him. Ten thousand, I'll kill him. I'll give him the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. But ten thousand, <laughs> you know, he was the only smart one. But that's the only time you see him in the beginning of the film until it gets closer to its end. Anyways, all these fishermen the next day. They go, well, before they go there, these two people thought, oh, we're going to be smart asses. We're going to go out there. I'm going to put my wife's rib roast on a hook and then chain it to the dock, throw it out there and see what happens. And then this scene, it, it kind of gets you all built up because it's like, oh, shit. You know, because the shark takes the bait and then actually runs off, pulls the fucking deck off, <laughs> and the guy goes with it. And then uh, his buddy's with him. He goes... Don't look back, just swim forward. Just keep swimming, keep swimming. <laughs> and it shows the, the music playing. But you still don't see the shark, you know? So you don't know how big it is, how mean it looks or anything like that. And then um, that was actually the same morning. And then later on through the day, that's when all the fishermen get together. And they start, like, all tag teaming, like, ganging up on boats. Uh, you have people from all over that area are trying to go in. And as this scene is going on, they introduce Richard Dreyfuss's character, who's Matt Hooper, who's part of the um, Ocean Life, uh, he's like an Ocean Life researcher, studies sharks and things like that, he comes in, and as Sheriff Brody, he's trying to, well, Sheriff, I'm going to keep calling him Sheriff, the Chief, the Chief, he's going crazy because he's trying to deal with everyone's bullshit, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, this car's parked over here and, and, and that, and, you know, he's trying to be a law-abiding citizen to all the people that he knows, and he's telling them, hey, you all, you all have too much shit in your boat, you're going to sink. You know, people are just laughing them off or whatever because they want to go get the reward. It's the 70s, you know. So they had to keep it a certain way, you know, for the time period for what it was, you know. But anyways, after that, that all goes on, they catch a shark. They come back. Everybody thinks it's the same shark. And while they're loading up the shark and everything, uh, Chief, the Chief Brody, he goes and takes uh, Hoopa. <laughs> I'm going to say it like Quint. Hoopa! Um, he takes him to the autopsy scene, and that's when he examines the body of the first girl and says basically like, okay, there's, you know, midsections bit off, there's no, there's only the sternum, the left side, and then he gets pissed because he's like, did you notify the Coast Guards? Uh, you have a great white shark out there. And then that's when they find out that a bunch of these fishermen, they caught a shark. They don't know if it's the exact one because he's over there measuring it. And then everyone's getting all excited. Then that's when he tells them, hey, it could be it, but it's 100 to 1. The only way we'll know is if we cut it open. The mayor said a dick thing where he's like, I'm not going to cut this shark open right here and have that kid spill out. <laughs> kind of fucked up to say that, but, you know, it, it worked for the film. And then you see the Kittler woman. She comes up and she slaps the sheriff and says, I just found out that there was another woman that just got killed by a shark. You knew and you let everybody go. How could you? I want you to know that my boy is dead. You know, and then she walks away. And then that's when he starts feeling the guilt. And you start to sympathize with it because he's dealing with everyone's bullshit. You know, and that's what he really was doing. And he's not supposed to be doing that because he's the chief, obviously. But later on, he goes home. He's kind of like sulking, drinking. Hooper comes by with a bottle of wine. They start drinking a lot. And then they said, okay, fuck it. Let's go and look for that shark. And so they go back to the shark that was kidnapped, gut it. And they figured out that it swimmed up from the Gulf of Mexico because there is a license plate from Mexico <laughs> from a car. And they were saying it's a tiger shark because it eats whatever, right? And then after that, they said, okay, well, the shark is still out there. And after that scene, they basically uh, start telling everybody, hey, there's that shark is still out there. We got to do something about it. And then all of a sudden, uh, Fourth of July comes around. <laughs> Nobody's swimming in the, in the actual like beach area. And then all of a sudden, the mayor, he's just like, hey, why don't you go over there? It's a hot, cool day out there. Got to go and swim. Got to go and keep that business. So a few people go swimming. And then all of a sudden, like, they think they see a shark because they're all in shark patrol. 
and they're actually wrong. Towards the end of the beach, there's like a little pond area, and the shark comes up and swims. And Sheriff Brody's son was like in a boat with his other kid friends, and this other guy comes up, hey, you guys aren't doing that right, you know, you gotta fold it, do that. That's when the shark comes by, boom, hits him, bites him on the leg, you see the leg go in the ocean, like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the kid's like all freaked out, you know, in shock. I mean, who wouldn't be when they see a big-ass shark like that? And this girl was screaming, that, hey, there's a shark in there. By the time they got to it, it was too late, but they saved the, uh, the chief's son. So anyways, you know, he goes to the hospital and deals with that. And then that's when he gets with the mayor and says, look, your kids are out there. My kids are out there. We're going to pay Quint $10,000. We're going to get that shit. We're going to get it taken care of, right? The mayor finally signs it. Then it starts with a whole scene where Hooper, which is Richard Dreyfuss' character, uh, Roy Schneider, who plays the chief, Chief Brody, and then you have Robert Shaw, who played Quint. Now, Quint was a great character. <laughs> The way that they perfected him, especially the actor who did him, um, it, it followed it to the T, but it's kind of sad because behind the scenes, he was kind of an alcoholic. So some of the scenes, he did slur his lines. Other scenes, he mostly improv But he played the character really good, and then it showed that he had real-life tension with uh, Richard Dreyfus. And so that's why when they filmed their scene, how they're kind of like pushing and shoving and being stupid with each other, um, that's how Robert Shaw really felt about him because he was you know, dealing with alcoholism. Nobody knew behind the scenes, you know? Um, they just knew that he had, like, a different attitude all the time. But anyways, they gear up, they go on the Orca, and that's when all the main iconic scenes come out. It's where, you know, he's shoveling all the, you know, fish guts and everything. And then all of a sudden, he throws out a line, the shark takes the line, and then all of a sudden, uh, they try to pull it in. Hooper's like, oh, it's a stingray. It snaps, and they're kind of bickering with each other. Then they finally see the shark come out. They put a harpoon on it with, uh, what do you call it? One of those kegs or a barrel. And I guess it's filled with air, so it doesn't let the fish dive. Obviously, this is no ordinary fish, <laughs> so it dives. Then they had a long night. They basically, you know, start drinking, start talking shit. And then you find out more about Quinn's character, why the way he is. Or you find out why, how he is, who he is, you know? Like, why does he act like that? Why is he a dick? Why is he a drunk? And then he tells this whole story about how he was on the uh, Indianapolis and he was on a secret mission when he was in the military to deliver the A-bomb for the Hiroshima bomb, right? As he's telling the story, they start kind of breaking out their song. You know, everybody knows this song. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. As that's going, you see the barrels come up and then all of a sudden he starts hitting the, the side of the, uh, the boat, the orca. And then all of a sudden it starts taking water in. And basically this whole movie, this the shark just keeps fucking with him. Like it wasn't a dumb shark. And then later on, you find out that uh, it they shoot another harpoon at it. They have three barrels. They tie it down. And then they try to tow it. But the shark was too powerful. Busted out the, the anchors on the boat. And then basically they were kind of like stuck in dead water. And so they said, okay, well we have a cage. Let's drop it down here. They drop a cage down there in the water with Hooper in there, and he's like, okay, I'm going to poison him with the spear. <laughs> that didn't work because the shark, you know, tore right through the cage. Hooper got out and stayed lay low. And then that's when Jaws, well, I was going to say Jaws. That's when the shark comes out. The Great White jumps up on top of the boat. The boat snaps in half. The most iconic scene ever is when they start sliding back. Quint, he basically, you know, starts kicking, fighting his way. He gets bit on the leg, gets bit in the middle, and gets taken down. And then the shark goes after Roy Schneider. And after it goes after him, he starts hitting it in the face, you know, with this, uh, what do you call it? The compressed air for when they go diving and shit. Then he breaks out of the window after he's holding the tank. And then he has M1. For those of you that don't know, that's an old military rifle and the bullet is like this big, you know? Well, that big. <laughs> big ass bullet, you know? Which surprised me because... At the ending scene, the shark has the tank, and it's coming at him full force. And then, you know, the best line, smile, you son of a bitch. Tank blows up, happy ending. Uh, then all of a sudden, Hooper comes up and says, hey, you know, I'm like, where's Quint? Didn't make it. And then it shows 
towards the credits that they got on the two of the barrels, they're kicking all the way till they get to shore. End of film, right? <laughs> this film still holds up to this day as being scary as hell. If you look at it from a realistic standpoint, this film also is the number one, or I shouldn't say number one, it was the first ever blockbuster, summer blockbuster movie that ever, like, topped the charts. Like, it, it was, I think for its time, it made, ooh, a shitload. I'm talking like 70 million. But if you adjust that, if you adjust that for inflation, that's probably like, you know, you're looking at the Dark Knight, Avatar kind of numbers, like close to a billion now these days. But um, the movie was scary as fuck. And a lot of people were worried that a lot of the scenes when you see the shark, it, it wouldn't be as scary. That was the main thing when they were making the film, especially Steven Spielberg came out and said it. Because they had to do the less is more approach because they built three different sharks. And one of them sank. <laughs> Uh, they built three different ones. One, so you see one side of it, the left side, one for the right side, and then they did like a full body one that jumped out and did the whole boat cracking scene and shit. And, you know, obviously they tested it on land. They actually filmed this in water, like in the actual ocean. That's what makes it even more creepy, you know? And the fact that they did all that with just probably, shit, I would say, honestly, from watching this film so many times, especially <laughs> especially since someone like my mother, she'll watch this film so many times that every time I see her, it's it seems like it, it's playing on repeat because I always come in and it's the same fucking scene. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, it's funny because it's like the, the way that they did it, you know, it's just less is more approach, made it more creepy. The fact like in the beginning where you see the girl kind of jerked around and everything, you probably, you only see maybe a glimpse of him when he gets the first kid and takes him down. It doesn't show much into it. And what's even funnier is that this film is rated PG. <laughs> I laugh at that. I'm like, holy shit, how could you do a horror film in PG? Well, they did. Steven Spielberg did because it's PG to our standards. But really, I think it was like PG-13 back in the day or... I, I know for a fact it wasn't rated R. I mean, there there was nothing that made it rated R, you know? But uh, it's considered PG, full and uncut, you know, if you see it on TV, even with all the blood and the gore, which is crazy. And the fact that they got the right actors to play it right, you know? Most of this film's budget was spent going into Martha's Vineyard, which is like uh, near Massachusetts, I believe. It's like a private little area you know they spent a lot of money trying to get that location and then they spent a lot more money on the effects than they did on the actual actors but all the actors they did great acting especially Quinn you know and like I said it, it was sad because right after this film came out it was probably like a few years after he had passed away from you know alcoholism and things like that so he never got to really see how big of a blockbuster this film became but there was a lot of issues on his end because I guess he had Something going on in life where he didn't have a visa and he was afraid he'd get deported. So when they needed him, he would literally fly down to Martha's Vineyard, film his scenes, and the same night would fly back just so he wouldn't get in trouble. And then he really had like this beef against with uh, Richard Dreyfus because he was always drinking and said he wanted to stop. And Richard, Richard Dreyfus would always go and like throw out his beer and shit. So there was a lot of tension. And they said, you know, it wasn't fun to shoot. But it was a great experience, you know, and because of this film obviously being such a huge blockbuster, I don't know how the hell that you can top it and make a sequel, but they did. They turned around and made a sequel, not just uh, any other sequel. They did part two, which you have Roy Schneider coming back as the chief. You have the mayor coming back and you also have uh, the chief's wife, uh, Lorraine. She came back and... Part two more or less involved that the shark was coming back. Nobody believed him. Everybody thought he was crazy. It played on that whole aspect. Obviously, that one didn't do as good as the first one, so they kind of let it rest for a little bit. They did part three in 3D. <laughs> um, that was in the 80s when 3D was the big craze. They made fun of it on Bob's Burgers. If you ever watch Bob's Burgers, the 3D Benin. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite episode on that, by the way. Um, and then they did part four. Part four was supposed to be like the original part three and complete the whole trilogy of the story. 
But what's stupid about the revenge is that it, it was another great white shark that remembered that its relative was killed by them. So it yeah. chased her down yeah. and followed her to like Jamaica where they were having vacation at. And it followed like the chief's sons. They're all, you know, older now. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was it was weird. That's why I was like, oh, hell no, you know. But the first one, the first one always will stand out. And here's the reason why it stands out. Because who knows what goes on in the ocean? I mean, like I said, they know more about the space and everything around us, you know, above us. But they don't know shit underneath us with all the water and everything, you know. I mean, they can only go so far down before they can, you know, not study anything. But I thought it's an interesting take. That a great white could go that far into the shallow. And it's actually true. Scientifically, it's true. That there has been stories of sharks swimming from the ocean and going into lakes. Now, they're not great white. They're, they're a different breed of sharks. They're like bull sharks. So they don't, like, attack you like what Jaws would do. They ram. They're, well, they swim super fast. They hit you. And then when you're dazed, that's when they attack. You know? <laughs> and I thought it was pretty interesting. And... You know, because of this movie, a lot of people built up fears on sharks and not wanting to get in the water and all that shit, you know, and <laughs> even now to this newer generation, you know, if, if they watch Jaws, they laugh about it because it looks so cheesy. You know, obviously with technology nowadays, it's way different. You know, everything's all CGI. They can, you know, digitally enhance all this shit. But back in the day, and I'm still a fan of prosthetics and actual puppeteering. Because it take, it's an art. It really is an art. And the way that they develop the, the shark, they call him Bruce the Shark, which they basically, you know, use that as a nickname for all the, like, the great white sharks. You know, they call it all Bruce. But anyways, the way that they developed the shark is that they got um, an, um, the makeup effects artist or the production designer of 20,000 Leeches Under the Sea. And I think that movie came out, shit, in the 40s, honestly. And the guy had retired, and the, des well, the production designer for Jaws, he got in touch with him. And this guy, he was, like, already in the 60s at the time, you know? And he basically said, oh, yeah, you know, they say you can't do it. We can do it. We can do anything you want. And he helped him build the actual Bruce full-size working um, jaw. Well, jaw. The great white shark. And it's pretty cool, you know? You hear all the little bit of stories here and there, you know, obviously there's YouTube, you know, the 10 facts that you didn't know about Jaws and stuff, but if you, you know, l look it up through Google or anything, it's interesting how they did this whole film and how much headaches they had to endure to make it. And not only that, it's still one of those films that, you know, it's, I wouldn't say iconic, it's one of those films that everybody knows, <laughs> because, um, uh, you know, obviously, they made fun of it on fucking Back to the Future Part 2, where it's like, Jaws 19, and he's pissed, you know? And, uh, obviously, like I said, um, Bob's Burgers made fun of Part 3, 3D. And, you know, obviously, everybody knows the theme song. Dun, 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 you know? And there's just so much good things that came out of this. I mean, look at Steven Spielberg's career. He took right off after that, you know? Uh, John Williams, right after he did that, he went straight on to Star Wars, and, you know, the rest is history. And, you know, with Jaws, it's a great film. If the, It's one of the, well, the only thing, the downfall of this film is that it, it's quite long, but if you've actually read the book from Peter Benchley, what I, what I would suggest is the book is different from the original movie. Well, the original movie, the movie. Because of the book ties in this whole love affair with Hooper and uh, Chief Brody's wife and how Hooper and the Chief, they had it out versus uh, Quint and Hooper having it out. Like that, that's a little bit of difference that they had. And then also to the way how the shark dies, you know, they, they inject it with the poison or whatever and then it just like, whoo, goes down. And that's the end of the original story. Obviously, Steven Spielberg, he had to put the Hollywood twist onto it. And make sure that, you know, there's explosions and a big ending. And ori originally, they had this to be a one-and-done film. There was no intentions of doing a sequel. But, I mean, you know, if you have a multi-million dollar movie, I mean, of course you can make a franchise out of that. And then, not only that, you could, I wouldn't say cash cow it, 
but you can make a whole franchise based off it if it's done right. But Steven Spielberg never came back for part two. I think he was executive producer. And then that's when they, you know, let it be cool for a while. And then they came back with part three. The only thing I remember about part three is that it was very cheesy, very computer CGI. You know, you see the shark coming in the green room like this, you know. And I think that was the only film that they ever filmed in SeaWorld. Some scenes, I think. I don't think the whole thing. And then uh, Dennis Quaid was in it. <laughs> That's the only thing I remember about that. Part 4, I remember because Michael Caine was in it. And then you had Lorraine Gray, you know, the the uh, sheriff. Or I was going to say sheriff. Chief Brody's wife from the first two films. She came back and it follows, like, the shark follows her and shit. You know, but overall, if you have to look at all these series... You always got to come back to the first one. Because the first one was scary as shit. It played on the lessons more. And who knows? I mean, there, there could be really, like, sharks swimming that close up shore. Not great whites, you know, but certainly there's other breeds of shark that are just as dangerous. You know, bull sharks, tiger sharks, all that shit, you know. And look at me. Here, I'm, I'm giving you a Shark Week 101 knowledge on these different breeds, right? <laughs> And y'all thought this was a horror podcast, right? I, I know. I impress myself sometimes. <laughs> but anyways, hope I started off your Shark Week damn good. Um, if you do end up catching this movie, part of a Jaws marathon, a Shark marathon that's been going on for Shark Week, um, let me know in the comments below. What would you think? Did you actually... Are you still scared of Jaws? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not scared of Jaws, the film. I'm scared of my ass going in the ocean <laughs> because of this film. You know, and if you guys are too, drop, drop a comment down there below. Let me know. You know, I'm always anxious to hear what your guys' thoughts, what you think, you know. But thank you for all tuning in for this episode. And like I said, when I'm all done and got nothing to do and I'm all out, we know where it goes, right? Bow down to the